Thank you. If you just make me host or co, oh my God, they're all coming in. Okay. All right. Wait, am I? Uh, oh, you're fine. You know what? I don't have to admit them. We, can, we don't have to admit them right now because we've got a couple minutes. So, yeah. Can you make me co host okay. or host? Yes, I'm doing it right now. Doing it yeah, right now. Also going there. It's a beautiful day. It's beautiful. Okay, I'm making you. I'm Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Vanessa. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi everyone. We want uh, everybody Vanessa. Else off this there screen. you are. There you are. Okay. Um, we just want to be on the screen, Vanessa. We don't want to see anybody else. Please. Right. I, I, I'll take <laughs> care. And, and also, would you change mine from sisterhood to June Social? Absolutely. Thank okay. you. Yes, are you there? Oh, no, you're off the phone. I'm right. I'm here, though. So. All right. I don't need to see anybody else. You don't need, I don't need to get our, my picture on. Uh, Vanessa, can you mute everybody and also cut their picture, their video? Because um, we're seeing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to highlight um, you, the two of you in one minute. And then. Um, and I, yes, uh, uh, let me work here. You can't see. Sure, I can. My picture's in there. If I'm with you. She's going to mute all the pictures. She's going to. Yeah, I hear Eddie Biederman. You're right. Uh, hello. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as much as we'd love to see everybody, it's distracting when we begin our program. So, mm -hmm. hi, Naomi. Hi, Eddie. Hi, nice to see you. Hopefully. <laughs> and Judy is with me. Okay, I hope so. Yeah. Good. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Judy. Hi, Joyce. I said hi, Naomi. <laughs> I'm going to say now, I hi. I see you're up there, though. I want to see your picture. <laughs> I'm going to say hi to Maggie, too. Hi, Maggie. Hi. Yeah, I'm I'd so like to start with you, Naomi. It will be soon. Vanessa will do that. I know. She will do that. She's going, going to get everybody to else off and put this um, on the floor so there's no. Oh, I, I think I saw Bob Benton, so uh, Babs is here. All right. Who's that? Doesn't inspire. No, I can't get over it. I can't be there. She did change that. She did. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. What difference did you make anyway? Oh, Abby Horwich. I'm so glad I see. I didn't see her. I haven't seen her in a long time. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Abby. Good to Hi, see you. I, I, I don't see you, but I'm glad you're there, darling. Glad Good to, to be here. Looking Good. forward to seeing you. Thank you. It's been a lot we're, of years. We're, we're looking forward to seeing us too. <laughs> There's Joyce. Um, so, uh, yeah. right, yeah. Joyce and June, you should. Um, you should, should I start the video? 
Yeah, start your video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let's let's start there. Then I'll. Right. Oh, here Hello. We here we are. It's too there you are. are. Good to see both of you. Thank you. Joyce, come a little bit closer. Yeah, this is good. No, this is the other one. I think maybe I'm taking off some of the books. Oh, oh there you go. Here, Joyce. Yeah, but I, it's only our faces. I okay. What's the difference? Right. I I think. <clears throat> take the books off. You, you both got your lipsticks on. We're, we're good to go here. It's just the frame. We can see your full face. I'm still admitting people. Um, I let people talk at the beginning and I'll, I have a couple of announcements and uh, okay. we still have three more minutes. Can okay. you, uh, I lost the picture. Can you put us back on? You're, I've, everyone can see just you now. Yeah, we see well, you. I, I can't see anything right now. I'm back to your meeting should start in a few seconds. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I'll launch it again. Should I'll I launch? Launch it again and I'll let you in because I, um, I have to let everybody. Yeah, I see them. Good. Yeah. We can all see. Right, all right. The marvels of technology. Yeah. You all can't right. live with them and you can't live without it. That's true. Okay. People still coming in. I, uh, we have 44 participants. That's, uh, we have 44 screens. That's probably, you know, 100 people. Julia, are you still exercising? Oh, okay. Because Joyce and June Sosha are both on. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to start. Um, we're going to start meeting. 10 30, starting in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Time. Um, I, I think you should mute the sound, Vanessa. I am going to mute the sound. Your sound is on, so the sound. Now you're going to have to unmute. There we go. You can hear us now. Yes, and everyone else is muted. Excellent. Please, right. And please. if you want to take off the pictures of everybody but us, uh, fine. Um. Um. That's a little bit harder, and I need That's to do fine. one. Right, and you can just right. We're um, good. We're good. Right. Um, so I wanted to let everyone know. Um, welcome. It's ten thirty. It's October fourth. Boker Tov, Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. And we have so much to get to here. Um, I want to welcome uh, Joy Schrager and June Sochin. It's so great to have you to kick off our adult enrichment. Mm -hmm. uh, two months ago, I asked you to come. I don't think that we could have predicted anything that has happened, even in the last 24 hours. Uh, yeah. They talk about uh, October surprises for the election. I, my, my heart, I don't know how many more surprises we can take. So, <laughs> Uh, let's just talk a little bit about the format. As you come in, I will. Everyone should be muted. Um, if you have a question, you can chat in the chat box. And um, we are recording this morning's um, today's adult enrichment, and that that will be up on our YouTube channel um, as soon as it uploads, and you know later this week. And um, it, it will take questions at the end. So um, I will try to communicate to you by chat. Um, so let's let June and Joyce take it away from here. And I don't even know where you're going to begin. Uh, indeed, we do know where we're going to begin. Good morning to everybody. Wonderful to be back at Macomb Solel Lakeside. I have such strong and long connections with each uh, wonderful organization. Thrilled to be back. We're going to begin with things that we have been thinking about for months as well, and then put them into the present day context. And the first questions that I would ask is, why are we surprised 
at anything that happens? Why are we shocked at anything that happens? Because in the last nine months, including the last devastating week of horrors, if you will, and difficulties, it is only a continuation of what's been going on for the last three plus years. Maybe in extremis, yes indeed, a progression of difficulties, but in our opinion, we have had a daily diet of horrors for all of this time. Indeed, we have seen a president, an administration during their words and deeds to absolutely violate laws, to sidestep traditions and, and crush norms and conventions, indeed to erase the separation of powers, the separation between the executive branch and the congressional branch, just forgetting who is supposed to do what with, with the other. Obliterated, stamped out. Uh, when you see recently, the Pentagon was offered money through the CARE Act, and the money was supposed to go for testing and a variety of other medically um, connected kinds of uh, activities. Indeed, they sent some of that money to defense contractors to buy military uniforms and airplane parts. Continuing with the behavior of the president who deferred funds from the Pentagon to build his wall, forgetting it's only the Congress <laughs> who is supposed to approve the budget. There's just no question about it. In the last months, I have been thinking about and talking about three big events that obviously have consumed, overwhelmed our country. Namely, number one, the COVID-19, obviously pandemic. Number two, the economic collapse. And number three, the civil unrest in our streets as a result but a continuation of the, the murder of George Floyd and then Bri Breonna Taylor and then Jacob Blake and on and on and on. But those three, which continue, of course, have to have two others added that are really existential. And I would say this is all, they are all existential threats. threats. And that would be climate change. We're still dealing with, my word, the ravages of the fires in the West, the hurricanes and floods in the East, the extreme weather starting earlier than ever before, climate change is a real threat and danger. But the Washington Post has been documenting through eight different sets of editorials on the demise and the difficulties of democracy in this presidency. And they are saying our democracy cannot withhold, could not withstand. withstand, thank you, could not, that's good to have you in here, <laughs> to, could not withstand um, the idea of a re-election, not only the demise of democracy and all of it, all of the trappings and the essential foundational issues that are here, but also across the world. Developing democracies are standing back and looking to see what would be. In fact, that brings me to think about it's the collectivity, the totality of what has been going on, the breaking of the norms and the violation of the laws and so on, to think of the words of a man named Finian O'Toole an Irishman who first wrote the words I'm going to quote in the Irish Times. If those of you who read the New York Review of Books, he has another piece, he has a lot of pieces, but it's called Unprecedented, not precedented, but unprecedented, and how this man has shattered all of the rules, the laws, the traditions, and so on. Finian O'Toole said these trenchant kinds of words. He said, America has been loved. America has been hated. America has been envied, but never before now has America been pitied. Wow, that we are being pitied. And it is the collectivity. It's the handling of the virus. It's the handling of the civil unrest. It's the handling in terms of the, of the election. It's the handling of everything that has come out of Washington in these almost four years. Um, a, a woman writer in, the, in Slate wrote, following, because now I'm going to go to three additional crises, actually four we're saying now, on top of the previous three that are in existence and that we are dealing with. A writer from Slate said, we have been in a bad way for a long time, indeed. But the death of Ruth Bader, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, is the hurricane on top of the wildfires that follow an earthquake. You could use those natural disasters as the imagery, the metaphor for what we have been experiencing. A shock a day, existential threats throughout. Really, really uh, incredible. So I'm gonna just itemize now the four, um, and we're keeping our eye on the clock because we're trying to be very serious about keeping to time for everybody. The death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg has presented, obviously, a Supreme Court crisis. 
also putting the judiciary, the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, in jeopardy of being politicized. And that's the other theme that will run through everything we're saying, because all the issues we are dealing with have through this administration been politicized, which have affected the trust factor in America. We don't trust any institutions, not the health institutions, not the courts, not the Congress, not the media. Everybody doesn't, nobody trusts anybody anymore. This is profound, not short term, this is long term. If you don't believe any form of government has a legitimacy, has a relevance, has, a, has an honorable uh, kind of being. Uh, this, this, con this confirmation process will go forward. That brings in my other thing, this president, wanting to politicize everything says we're going to do it and these are his words warp speed so we're going to have a new supreme court justice warp speed because it's political he tells us he wants the ninth member if there are only eight members of the court and the, and the election um, goes into the supreme court he wants that ninth vote and look at his implication that his nominee coupled with the other two nominees would vote on his behalf and legitimatize what he would say. The politicization of the process takes your breath away. She will be confirmed. And later on in our discussion, we'll talk a little more about her, but I just wanna outline these kinds of ideas. The second point is the politicization of the process, not just the Supreme Court, of finding a vaccine, the search for the vaccine. Who trusts the FDA now? Who trusts the Centers for, uh, for Conflict, never got disease. Disease. Centers disease. for Disease and Prevention? Control. It used to be the gold standard of public health in the world that we were the leaders, we set the standards, we were the role models, and now it's a change every single day. No, we didn't mean what we said now, now another things, because he, the politician has intruded politics in everything. Warp speed, politics, which have absolutely caused cracks in our foundational democracy uh, and causing this kind of, of serious issue. And the third is the obvious, the idea, which he said once again, very explicitly during the debate, that if he thinks there are thousands of uh, the mail-in ballots are clearly going to be fraudulent and therefore the election will be rigged and therefore we will not necessarily quietly understand the transfer, the peaceful transfer of power. He has now brought us to the level of a banana republic. Where is the difference between the United States today and Belarusia, Belarus, and that guy refusing to step down even though it was, a, it was genuinely a fraudulent election when he had 80% of the vote. Who are we today? I think we are beyond a massive identity crisis but we are in a dem democracy crisis. Well, the first thing I say after good morning is a uh, famous Yiddishism, oy vey. <laughs> we are, we are uh, obviously in trouble. I want to transition from Joyce's overview to what is the pressing concern right now, which she's alluded to, and that is the presidential election. And I know the first thing on most of your minds, which I'll get to toward the end, is uh, the president has COVID, is in the hospital. We don't really know his condition. The very things Joyce was talking about, the politicalization of everything, the falsification of everything, we will talk about that uh, in a moment. But I wanna provide some background in talking about the presidential election. First of all, a little, a little bit of history that I think offers you a context in which to look at this presidential election. If you go back to 1992, Bill Clinton's first election, there have been seven elections. In those seven elections, the Democrats have won six of the seven pop in popular vote. But only two Democratic presidents have been elected. Bill Clinton for two terms and Obama for two terms. The other two elections, by the way, the only one where the Republicans won both the popular vote and the electoral vote George was George Bush in his second, his reelection in 2004. 2000, as you well know, was a fraught election. And it went to the Supreme Court wrongly from my point of view. And by the way, a lot of the history books and the, the, the reporting mistakenly say Trump, uh, that Al Gore lost the 2000 election by 537 votes. That's not correct. 
Al Gore won the popular vote. 48.7% to 47.9. It was close, but he won the popular vote. The 537 was the votes in Florida when they stopped the counting. They stopped the counting because the Republicans, under their much more aggressive lawyers, stopped, asked the Supreme Court to consider whether they should continue with the recount. The Supreme Court sided with the Republicans and Al Gore, very diplomatically, graciously, very graciously chose to accept the decision. So that's important. And the other example where the Democrats won the popular vote, of course, and lost in the Electoral College was 2016. And we know all about that. So when we come into 2020, we're in a situation where it's clear the Democrats have the popular vote in this country. The majority of Americans support the Democratic Party, the Democratic agenda, but the Republicans have found a way in the Electoral College, you know, of, of moving to victory. And so that is the framework. This election is novel, it's unique in a lot of ways. The first way is you have two very old men running for the presidency. Sure. <laughs> well, you know, it is the truth. I, I went back and looked at um, Ronald Reagan was 69. 69. I know. I looked at it. I looked it up. Uh, we have a 74 year old running and a 77 year old who will be 78 when he, if he, if Next he takes office. Right. What's interesting is Trump is the third and maybe the last example, well, uh, of a baby boomer. Biden is older than the baby boomer. Biden is a silent generation, which is what where a lot of us are. The baby boomers began in 1946. The first baby boomer elected was Bill Clinton, and he was only 46 when he was elected. The second baby boomer was uh, George W., and he was 54 when he was elected. Trump was 70 when he was elected. So he's the last pretty much of the baby boomers. The fact that they're both older men, you could argue, is both a negative and a positive. The negative is a concern about their health, obviously now. That's dra dramatically in display with Trump being in the hospital. But it's also, you could argue, a positive thing. It should suggest that Americans are living longer. They're living healthily longer. They're functioning longer. Nancy Pelosi is 80. Steny Hoyer is 81. You know, these guys are, are older, but they're still functioning quite effectively. But that, so that's a novel feature. Another very important novel feature, though, is the president who is running for re-election has had no political experience before running for president in 2016. None. He'd never been appointed to, a to an executive function in the government. He'd never been a cabinet secretary. He had never run for office before. I mean, this is stunning. I don't think we've ever seen this in American history. Now, that not, is not to say that only experienced people who have extensive experience should be president and do the best as president, because I'll give you an example, a quick example. Some of you know, Vanessa knows this particularly. I'm a historian. So I, uh, I, let me give you just two quick examples from American history. One of my favorite presidents was John Quincy Adams. Brilliant, highly experienced, and an unsuccessful one-term president. The worst president before George Bush and Donald Trump was, was uh, James Buchanan. Also very experienced, a lot of experience in both the legislature and executive and diplomatic circles, but he was a flop, also one-term president. So Donald Trump is, you might say, in good, bad company. Uh, he's in the same company as people, but no, he's, excuse me, let me correct myself. He's unique. Buchanan had a lot of experience. Adams had a lot of experience and they were bad presidents. He was, uh, Donald Trump in many ways fulfills the adage that if you don't have any experience or any knowledge, you're going to be a bad president. So that's another feature. Thirdly, this president has never gotten over 50% of approval in anything he's done. He has a hardcore base which is very, un and he, one of the things he has done in four years, and that affects everything that Joyce talked about and will continue to talk about. 
he has solidified into a, when they keep talking about the core supporters. It is a hard core. And it's a hard core that looks at the world through the lens of pro-Trump. So to his supporters, he's a warrior in the hospital. To his critics, who knows what. Thirdly, what's important is that um, the election is taking place, as Joyce has suggested, during turbulent and fraught times, but even more so during a pandemic. We've never held an election, you know, the 1918-19 election was at the end of Wilson's term and into the, um, the Harding term. So during a pandemic, you're running a presidential election. And then perhaps most importantly in this regard is a president who is trying to delegitimize the very election we're talking about. He's arguing that the ballots, the mail-in ballots, are by definition fraudulent. There's rampant, massive voter fraud in this country. These are all blatant lies. This lie is more than the 20,000 plus lives that have already been confirmed during the four years of Donald Trump. This lie supersedes all lies because it endangers the, the, the election. It endangers voter participation. It suggests why bother if this is a fraudulent election. And there are a lot of people, although one of the, I think, hidden ironies of all this is maybe his supporters won't go to the polls. <laughs> because I, that, I know, well, but you could argue if he thinks the whole thing is fraudulent. But this is a terribly important factor that a president who has delegitimized the election, he's also, um, uh, he's also the president who is sick right now. Can he, can he ever return to the campaign tra trail? We have less than 30 days to go in this election. So we're in highly unpredictable territory. When just a, one other comment that I'll make before I'll turn it back to Joyce. When you talk about the confirmation of a Supreme Court justice, two members, two Republican senators of the Judicial Committee Judicial. are sick with COVID. Can they participate in the confirmation hearings? Uh, the Senate does not allow virtual meetings. This is a very important feature. So we are in fraught times, and I'll end by saying oy vey again. <laughs> May I make a few comments on what you've said? Just to be specific, in the Senate Judiciary Committee, it's 12 Republicans to 10 Democrats. So if uh, Mike Lee of Utah and Tom Tillis, who's in a very close race in North Carolina, both Republican members of the Senate Judiciary are not able to attend the Senate Judiciary meeting. It's a 10 to 10, uh, and I don't know what they would do with it. I don't know that they have any precedent of how to handle the, it would be a tie vote in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And lo and behold, it is possible then that Amy Coney Barrett could not be uh, pushed on to go uh, to the larger Senate. Well, just one addendum to that. In the New York Times today, they say that they probably take Tillis uh, and, uh, Lee. and Lee out of their sick beds and, <laughs> and seat them in the gallery of the Senate. So they'll be far away from the floor of the Senate. Oh, that's I mean, right. That's you know what, what we're talking about here. Because Mitch McConnell is, is uh, you know bound and determined that he's going to do this. He said that his greatest joy in life was denying Merrick Garland a hearing. It takes my breath away. That's the greatest joy. Let me just now respond to something else. Um, two things. Number one, I forgot to say it earlier, because, but I think it collapses and heightens and deepens the, the uh, difficulty, the enormity of the problems that we have. One, a wise woman, one of my former, many of my former ex-sisters-in-law said the following. She said that in the year 2020, we are experiencing what 1918 was, the Spanish flu pandemic, 1929, the economic collapse, the depression, and 1968, civil unrest in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. 1918, 1929, 1968, all in at the same time, simultaneously, 2020. I thought that was important. But if I may now just continue with one of your thoughts, June, which I enjoyed so much, I had, we had 
heard what each one is going to say. So it's a fresh experience. <laughs> That's why we compliment each other because yeah. we haven't yeah. heard these words before. Right. I'm not bored whatsoever. <laughs> uh, um, that the, uh, when you talked about the age and stage of, uh, of the two candidates, one thing I think is extremely important. In modern American history, political scientists have always undervalued the vice presidential choice. They've said, nah, that's not how Americans ever vote. It doesn't matter who the VP will be. One could argue that Dan Quayle hurt, um, uh, there's no question Dan Quayle may have hurt H.W. Bush and Sarah Palin may have hurt John McCain. So although with those two exceptions, well now in a positive way, then how will Kamala Harris fare versus Mike Pence and we'll see it next Wednesday, and we'll watch that debate with new interest and a seriousness that if whoever would become president, the possibility that either one would not necessarily last the whole time, and the role and relevance of the vice presidency, I think. That's a good point. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> so, um, so I wanted to, to mention that. I'm going to start, though, with, um, and we'll discuss in our little discussion, uh, each of those factors that we talked about before. But I thought we should first of all address, because we promised we would, uh, looking at the Senate races, and then June will, has talked about the presidential race, and we know and we know what the choices are very, very clearly. Maybe we could just say this in, in this D. They are uh, polar opposites on every subject. But also another factor that I should get in. Because everything, everything has been politicized, Every aspect of government and every aspect of our lives is politicized. That is, if we wear masks, we're Democrats. If you don't wear a mask, you're a Republican. If you send in a mail-in ballot, which I and my husband and I are preparing to do right now, today, you are a Democrat. But if you appear in person, you are a Republican. How shockingly that each and every act, be it in health, be it in politics, be it in whatever, should be labeled and marked in such an extremist that they are separations in this way. So with that said, um, and I have all these scenarios and we are very hopeful and, and also I let him be well, Tom Tillis, but he's in a very tight race. The, uh, the savants are estimating Right now, in terms of the Senate, the lineup is as follows. There are 53 Republicans, 47 Democrats. If the Republicans lose three, that brings them 50, and it brings the Democrats up to 50, it's a tie. But right now, with a Republican um, vice president, who is the president of the Senate, they would always win. So the Democrats for insurance should have to get at least four more seats to be able to over to four or five, even if you will. But if they but, win the presidency. But yeah, if they win the presidency. But my also oh, they, my they worry don't, is don't the uh, of the 5347, 23 Republicans, it's the way the cycle works. Every two years, it's one third, one third, one third of the Senate are up for re-election. So this year, luckily, in some ways, in definite ways, 23 Republican senators are up for re-election and only 12 Democrats, that's 35. 23 Republicans, 12 Democrats. Uh, one has to mention at the outset so that my numbers don't wax, that two Democratic senators are in trouble. One is in great trouble, and that is Doug Jones in Alabama, who just squeaked in, and he was running against Roy Moore, this crazy guy who dated 14-year-olds, and so on, and we had all of these wild theories. So Doug Jones, the sitting Democratic senator in Alabama, is in some trouble. Gary Peters, who is the Democratic senator in Michigan, is also possibly vulnerable. That takes away two votes from the from the Republican from the Democrats Democrat. to make them 45. It tightens the, the need for way, way more. But among the 23, some I have a CNN poll, I have a Washington Post poll, which of the Republican senators are most vulnerable and what which are the ones that could be pickups for the Democrats? I think top of the list would be Susan Collins of Maine, that she may be in trouble. Number two would be um, uh, Martha McSally of Arizona, Mark Kelly, remember the astronaut, the husband of Gabby Giffords. So hopefully after Maine, Arizona, in Colorado, Cory Gardner, the Colorado has turned more blue, it was purple, but it's more blue. Cory Gardner, who is a solid guy, but very much attaching himself to the president, and he is being challenged by the um, former mayor of Denver, uh, governor of Colorado, John Hickenlooper. Remember, he ran briefly for president, too. So those top three are on everybody's list, Maine, Arizona, and Colorado. 
And then you could go to North Carolina with Tom Tillis, who's in a tight race. I'm hopeful you can go to South Carolina because Lindsey Graham's um, guy is Jamie Harrison, who has now had a real boost. He has more money in his uh, cash uh, availability than does Lindsey Graham. I mean, that would be an incredible win and very important, but let's hold those up. Joni Ernst in Iowa is in a very tight race. Um, Dan Sullivan, the Republican in Alaska, is in a tight race. A good other race is Montana. Steve Bullock, who also we were introduced to the country, remember the climate change guy, he's the governor of Montana, and he is in a race with, his name is Steve Bullock, with a guy named Steve Daines, who's a first term senator, who seems like a bland character, whatever, but Bullock, the Democrat, has been two term Democratic governor of Montana. So Montana looks as if it could be a pickup. Um, I said Iowa, I've said both Carolinas, I think I've said Maine, um, South, I think I've said all of those, so it added up to about eight or nine. If, and then there are the others, I mean, they're the hopefuls they are saying in Texas and in Kansas, I think those are reaches, or in Kentucky. Would that be yeah. a story if Mitch McConnell, Amy <laughs> McGraw has gotten a lot of money. People, it's been a national election looking at these particular pivotal Senate races. But that would be a, a reach. But I, you know, my, one of my adages, one of my husband's clients used to always say, never let the best be the enemy of the good. If we don't get the best, a presidential, a Democratic president and a Democrat majority Senate, I would be very happy with a Democratic majority Senate, at least at minimum. Obviously, we want both. But let's settle for the good or a Democratic president, which even would be better, except his hands would be tied if it, the majority still remains in the hands of the, of the Republicans. You know, I'm working with different scenarios, which are very, very difficult. Yeah, that's, that's a good summary, obviously, of the Senate. I wanted to move to a, another topic, and then we will, within 10 or so minutes, then Joyce and I are going to, we're going to talk now. And I wanted to first talk about, because we did originally advertise that we were going to talk a bit about Jewish Americans and Israel, since we are settled at, at, at Solel, I think that's an important factor. I My want, home, Solel Lakeside. Right. I wanted to, uh, first of all, suggest to you something that's, uh, I think, not enough, as you, not enough people acknowledge, and that is any group is more diverse than characterized. When you say Jewish Americans, that sounds like it's a monolith. All Jewish Americans think alike, no matter how old they are, what generation they're in, what their political ideology and social position is. That's not true. But why? Sometimes the generalizations apply, and oftentimes they don't apply. One way in which they do apply is Jewish Americans as an ethnic group have been more liberal than most other groups in America. Uh, one of the political scientists I know once said, Jewish Americans earn like Episcopalians, but they vote like Puerto Ricans. And, and that is, I think, a good quick way of characterizing Americans' view, American Jewish views of domestic policy. They're liberals. And I would argue uh, there is a, a new uh, post by Abe Foxman, who many of you know, was the longtime director of the Anti-Defamation League. <clears throat> and all the years that he was with the Defamation League, he never had political, he never made political comments. He never openly endorsed candidates. Now that he's retired, he just had a blog in the Times of Israel, and he made the point that he thinks that the uh, Jews have to vote for the Democrats in this presidential election. They cannot support Trump. And Foxman says that with uh, an important knowledge that I'll mention in a moment, but he tries to remind Jews that if you believe in the prophets, if you believe in Jewish core values, you believe in helping all people and helping minorities especially. And from a pragmatic point of view, as has been seen throughout the world, whenever any group is attacked and oppressed and discriminated against, the next one up for such treatment are the Jews. So from a very practical point of view, Jewish people as minorities should always be concerned with all minorities but it's also in keeping with the moral values of this culture. Now, the only group in, um, among the Jewish Americans, whom I say they share a, a political philosophy, about 70% of Jewish Americans vote Democratic all the time. 
One area, though, where there is a significant difference, and it has grown in recent years, is in, its, in the attitude of Jewish Americans toward Israel. We always point out the fact that Orthodox Jews in America largely look at the presidential election in terms of the, the administration's behavior toward Israel. And so among Orthodox Jews in America, there's a strong allegiance to Trump because he supports Israel, because he moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And now because of this deal uh, between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, the, the view is, as many of you know, it largely was a bribery scheme on the American part. In fact, as evidence that it's largely bribery is the fact that they, the Americans are trying to negotiate with Bahrain, excuse me, with Sudan, Sudan to join that group of three. And there, it's a question of money. Sudan wants so many billion dollars. The American government is promising so many hundreds of millions of dollars. In other words, it's it's simply a monetary exchange. But the point I'm making here is that among younger generations of Jewish Americans, there's not the same fervent Zionism that you have among both the Orthodox Jews and older generations. I would argue the silent generation, the baby boom generation of Jewish Americans largely were committed to the establishment of the state of Israel and allegiance to the state of Israel. And even among the um, older millennials, those who, uh, uh, well, it would be, no, yeah, it, it would be the, the older generations uh, that believe that no, the Six Day War in 1967, and that renewed a commitment to Israel on the part of many young Jews. But among the very much younger Jews, they are not, they may be closer tied and accept Israel's existence, I hope, but they also are pro-Palestinian. They see the Palestinians as an oppressed people. And certainly with the, you might say, new vitalization of the left among the young, uh, you know, among the woke generation, if you will, Israel can be seen as a, an imperialistic nation, an occupier. So you can see, I, we're not going to go into all this in detail at this point, but the point I'm making is there's some diversity in the Jewish American population, largely by generations, as to the nature of their commitment toward Israel. But there's no question that in domestic affairs, overwhelmingly, Jewish Americans are Democrats. Now let's, let, I'm going to let Joyce May I respond comment. to a few points that I'm going to respond. We saw in the chats two questions that were raised that I want to also include. But first of all, if I made two things that you just said on the heels of what you've said, um, June, I would not use the word bribery. I would say transaction, oh, a oh, deal. It's a business deal. I, I'm sorry, and it, and the United States sweetened the deal is what June is saying. But also I will just plug in another fact. The, the, discussion, the discussion and negotiations between Israel and the UAE have been going on for years. This was not new. It was not something that just happened. The UAE has wanted, as does Saudi Arabia, advanced weapons. I mean, I'm horrified at what they say that they may sell to them. That the idea, the trust factor, that this administration will trust the Arab country, that the guy could be gone, you know, who next year, who knows? And you're not uh, uh, at all doing, I think, an intelligent thing. The second thing, if I may, regarding what you said, I think that on top of the allegiance to Israel by the Orthodox community, without question, is some of the social issue agenda. You know, I think about Sheldon Adelson, I wonder, and others, Israel was his uh, mo mo uh, most important point. But the social agenda against gay marriage, against trans gender issues I th against abortion. Okay, I think that's, that, that's the very same orthodox group. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But I'm yeah. saying in addition to Israel, right. I'm saying there's a lot of the um, domestic social agenda yeah. the orthodox opposed. Point. Just the way evangelical Christians could do it solely on terms of why they're doing this. There were two comments that were on the um, 
chat, and these were really good points. Somebody said, you haven't mentioned to me um, the two Georgia racists. I'm not hopeful, but there are two Republicans. David Perdue is a sitting senator. I think he's okay. But the other is Kelly uh, Loeffler was a big time fund fundraiser donor. It's possible she is vulnerable. So that it's an unusual thing that one state has two set Republican senators up for re-election. So thank you for that question. There is that possibility. I wasn't going there, but thank you because there is that possibility. The second point um, that, was, uh, that somebody wrote, aren't we concerned? Well, of course we are, and we just didn't get there, if you will, if I may, uh, with the extreme white supremacist groups and the way the president was, you know, really giving his silent or not so silent nod to the extremists and as well as the QAnon and all of those terrible things. But I'm going to answer it in this one way. I was saying earlier that the country is so divided on every single issue that you're a Democrat or you're Republican, whether you're a mask or whether you uh, send in your ballots. This is a third. When polls have been taken, I think it's the Pew Center recent poll, to which do you think, asking Democrats and Republicans, are the greatest threats to democracy in America? Democrats say domestic terrorism, which by the way, there is no law defining domestic terrorism. And Republicans say foreign terrorism. And the Democrats will say both dem internal, but the Democrats are very keenly aware of the huge threat to our democracy that these ultra right wing arms carrying heavily armed uh, kinds of um, white supremacists and speaking to June's earlier point, who else are they going to come after? They are anti-Semitic as well as anti-minorities and anti-immigrants and so on. But to tie that together, you know, you're absolutely right. They support Trump. Yes, but that's the point. So that he will do nothing to deny supporters. You know, he's indiscriminate in his supporter uh, base. What is this here now? I'll, I'll see. I'll do it. Okay. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to underline that point. And then I wanted, if we can talk about, I, I think we should talk a little bit about foreign affairs. What time is it? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing pretty well. We're going to stop though in about five minutes and then allow many more questions and comments. But I think a few words should be said about American foreign policy. This is a president who has taken us out of most international agreements at a time when, you know, to say the United States is the only superpower in the world. You know, think about what that means. That means that generally we've been deferred to. People look to us for guidance, whether it's climate control, whether it's uh, nuclear disarmament, whether it's aid to poor countries, developing countries, whatever the issue is. And there's no one to look for here. They can't look it to the White House because the White House has said, America first. We only, we are returning to isolationism. This is a very dangerous position to be in not to be in, and the uh, many people argue that in the middle of a pandemic, to leave the World Health Organization, to deny it funding, to deny it the guidance Joyce mentioned earlier, the CDC was always the gold standard. Where can the World Health Organization look for research, for expertise, if not the United States of America? It is, this, this adds a layer of danger to everyone that is, you know, really troublesome. Uh, one of the questions that I just saw was regarding Russian Jews and that they are pro-Trump. Yes, indeed they are, they, because they have bought the message that Biden is a socialist, <laughs> as this is one thing in terms of current. They're normally very conservative, and socially they are conservative, and they like the image of a strong man, if you will, who has, which I would say he's the, one of the weakest people that you ever would meet. But this is the image, and also the image of the frail, but that the, Biden will be tugged to the left and will be a socialist country. And we left Russia and we left socialism. We wouldn't want that again. And they are not as interested in some of the social values, perhaps. I don't want to. But when June also said America first, I've always thought if you're America first, you become ultimately, which is what is being revealed, America only. Our gal allies are not even including us in meetings now. They're discussing the problems about, I'm interested in agorno karabakh in terms of Armenia and Azerbaijan. I don't think that's on the lips. And we also know that most Americans could give no interest at all in foreign policy. And that's why it's not appeared yet on the campaign stage or on the debate stage. 
because most Americans don't care. But those are very serious issues. The European allies and some of the NATO, I guess the NATO allies, have had meetings about what to do. Or Belarus, where are we? They don't even bother to talk to us anymore because they don't believe we are trustworthy. The trust factor that I brought up earlier in terms of Americans no longer trusting the institutions, the levers of power, be it a health organization or be it government or whatever, is obviously imitated across the world. They are all shaking their heads. Remember Finney and O'Toole. We were loved, we were hated, we were envied, but now we are being pitied because of this lack of leadership withdrawal from the world, let's do the larger point, as well as the smattering of all traditions, norms, conventions, and laws. If we want to be further depressed <laughs> in terms of world leadership, consider the fact that next year Angela Merkel will leave the chancellorship of Germany. I would argue she's the, she's the only really first class, first rate uh, leader in the world today. Macron doesn't have that kind of heft Certainly Boris Johnson doesn't have that kind of heft. Poor Italians, who even knows who their prime minister is right now, uh, they change so much. Uh, you're going to really be in a rudderless, leaderless world very soon. Well, June, you have forgot Vladi, yeah. as well as Xi Jinping. The, right. the country that certainly has the capability of moving into the slot if they really would develop certain things and are in a lot of ways is China. Right. Russia is obviously fading, doesn't have the economic power, uh, although also the story that I just mentioned, Nagarno, Nagorno-Karabakh, is that something that Russia is supporting Armenia, whereas Turkey is supporting Azerbaijan. So, I mean, you, you, but again, most people eyes gloss over when you say it, but these individual conflicts have larger global implications, yeah. as well as obviously implications that we are, uh, we are missing in action, MIA. You, you, uh, that's a very important point. But particularly, uh, some of the commentators have noted that uh, why, one of the events that has not been well reported in the last few days because of what's going on in this country, and, and by the way, I haven't yet really, we should go back to Let's that, uh, but um, Xi Jinping made a very important speech before the Chinese Communist Party just the other day, in which he talked about the vision for the future. And he talked in terms of the scientific developments that they are concentrating on. Artificial intelligence, which has enormous implications for the future of technology in all kinds of areas. They are investing in science, in economic development in a way, now that doesn't mean that they're not without their problems. China has lots of problems as well. But the point is they are trying to position themselves as a leader in a world where there are no other enough leaders. Let me also enter another, which I've, I'm sorry to say, we've given the, we, because we're wondering which of all the topics we've mentioned will drive voters to the poll. Will there be topic A that will be Republicans, will be topic B that will be Democrats, but the topic that I think is certainly in my opinion at the top of the list and has shown the shocking lack of values, the shocking the gratuitous cruelty of this administration has been their policy on immigration. The latest story has been, indeed, when, when this administration came into office in 2016, there were 81,000 immigrants in, admitted into the country. Refugees. They were refugees. The refugees. There's, that's a separate category, refugees, asylum seekers from legal immigrants, et cetera. There were 81,000. Last year, there were 18,000, one eight. 18,000 had been 81,000. And now the other day in the lack of the darkness of night or whenever uh, the president issues an order that says we're going to lower that to 13 or 15, whichever. Lowering it to a bottom line that's never been this low, shutting the door. I always say that the woman sitting at the Statue of Liberty should be weeping copious tears now because we are no longer open for business, which ties in the, with the Chinese. Because we will deny immigrants, even the students who are here, denying their visas. 100,000 Chinese graduate students aren't being allowed in. And, and to allow, and then to stay without immigration, both top and uh, unskilled, skilled, educated, uneducated, the United States will fall dramatically behind in technological advancement. So we'll no longer not only politically be respected, we won't any longer have the economic edge because we won't have that talent of all the people that have been studying here and remaining here as well. Maybe let's just quickly go back because then we will want to allow questions, but let's quickly go back to the issue of Donald Trump is in the hospital. 
We don't really know how sick he is. Because once again, we talked earlier about politicizing everything. Uh, Dr. Conley, his chief physician said, you know, he's doing fine, doing terrific. And then Mark Meadows goes to the reporters and says, we've been very concerned, things are bad. Trump has a temper tantrum. Meadows calls Fox News right away and says, uh, no, things are going well, things are going well. The point is we don't know how things are going. And that has led the conspiratorialists in this country on the wild west web, the dark web to go crazy. On both sides, the left and the right. I heard on television some women who are interviewed who are Democrats saying, this, he, he's doing this to himself just to delay the election. He doesn't want the election. So he's not really sick. He's just in the hospital to delay the election. Then you talk to a woman who is a Trump supporter and she says, he's a warrior. This was thrown at him by the Democrats. <laughs> they, they, they covered all of his food and everything with all kinds of terrible things, but he's going to get over it because he's a warrior. So the point is, we are in, that's another layer of tension and uncertainty in this uncertain world. I have one comment, uh, Carol. I respect what you're saying. 18,000 was, was what this administration has done, and maybe it's under whatever, as you said, it's 11,000 something, because there is the, they may have a number that is possible, but it does not mean that they allow people in. There haven't been a people allowed in in the last month or two at all. So you're absolutely true, right in this way. Um, so well, I think that we should open it up right now for the last 15 minutes or so. Let's, we're, okay. Um, um, so. so we have one coming in right now, working on on combating voter suppression right now during this great presentation. Uh, this is Rob Lindner. Um, and if you want to join him, um, you can email Rob or Rhonda and their emails in the chat. Um, and you can put your questions in the chat or, or raise your hand or um, chat me. Um, if you had a crystal ball, what do you think is going to happen on election day? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I can't, can I answer? You want sure. To? No, go ahead. I think it's going to be a landslide for Biden. I think. In your tzah Hashem. That's right. That means if the Lord is willing. I really think that this has, first of all, we know that the number of, quote, undecided voters is very small, maybe 5%. Everybody is baked in. Every, and, it, and if anything, I thought Nancy Pelosi expressed the Democratic view, which is now much more highly motivated. Now, you could argue that, you know, the Trump supporters are pro-Trump. The Democrats are anti-Trump. But I think this will make them, in a sense, more pro-Biden as well. Nancy Pelosi said it well the other day, being the honest truth teller. She said, the brazen, that was her word, the brazen disregard for the rules, unfortunately, has consequences. She's talking to Trump like he's a child. He has brazenly violated the rules and he's paid the price. I think Democrats will see it that way. I think independents will see it that way. I think suburban women will see it that way. In other words, they won't feel sympathy for Trump getting sick. They will think, you caused this to yourself. You flouted the rules and this is what happened. It's gonna be a landslide. Well, I hope June is right, as I said, I'm here to Hashem. <laughs> but um, I would make one observation that has been troubling. Because Joe Biden has observed the rules, and he has masked, and he has socially distanced, and he's had very, very few, he hasn't had any kind of rallies, he, hasn't had, he doesn't have poll watchers or poll volunteers who are ringing doorbells where you have it on the other side. Now, I'm thrilled with the LeBron James of the world who has, who has raised 10,000 volunteers to be poll watchers. Think about what the, the, the president, the different language, you want to have poll volunteers, poll monitors, but the president wants them to be in the polls checking to see what is happening, which is obviously against the law, against the rules. So I'm worried about the volunteers on the uh, grassroots um, in advocacy for Joe Biden. I am hopeful that this is a, something that the, in the last 30 days, the Democrats have a, a major kind of effort, a thrust to have more volunteers, to be out doing more things, um, to try to match that, what he has done. And obviously along with it is, to, in order to have a landslide, you have to have a, an overwhelming voter turnout. 
And obviously those who did not turn out for Hillary in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia specifically, in Detroit, in, in Milwaukee, yeah. in those three states, it was such a tiny margin of 77,000 votes for the three states. If Jill Stein had not been on the ballot in Wisconsin, Hillary would have won Wisconsin. Her vote was 12 or 13,000, which was the difference in D. Yeah. So that we don't have any kind of serious third party that are on the ballots. You don't have, uh, you still will have the Russian interference and everybody else's interference and misinformation. If anybody watched Rachel Maddow the other night, an incredible story out of Detroit, Michigan, of two conservative activists who are sending robocalls to clearly black Detroit. 80% of the city of Detroit is black, so, telling them, if you mail in your ballot, you know, you're giving information, data to the, to the government. And if you ever had a credit card problem or a felony or something else, I don't think you should be doing it total misinformation yeah, and the very uh, great fighting female attorney general of the state of Michigan is on top of it. But this kind of rank disinformation, which happened in 2016, misinformation, falsehoods, and this kind of the uh, ardent campaign to suppress the vote, which is a various issue. But let's remember, I didn't get this in before, election law is state law. That's what and I'm there are 50 say. different states with 50 different mm -hmm. election laws. Can you send it in before and will they open it? Can you do it? What would the postmark be? Um, I just got the ballot because we're Florida residents. You can't have it postmarked any law either then they won't even accept it even if they get it after uh, November 3. Other states are different. Look at what Florida is doing in denying people who have served their prison terms. And there was a constitutional referendum in Florida and two thirds of the Florida voters in, the, in great wisdom gave, said, we'll restore the voting rights for people who have paid their dues literally paid their t in terms of being in jail. And now the state legislature dominated by Republicans said, no, 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 you have to pay your fines. They don't have any records about what fines and sometimes it's $100, $200. And Michael Bloomberg and other organizations are pitching in and they are fighting it in the courts. So there is litigation that's going on until the very day of the election. I, I wanna make just one other point and then we, if there are other questions or comments. Uh, Joyce touched on this. The voting and the election system in this country is highly decentralized. Right. Each state has its own way. And one of the things that's become very clear is the secretaries of state of each state run the elections. And the Republican secretaries of state are as committed to running a clean and fair election. I was a as, remember Catherine Harris in Florida. Well, you know, yeah, she's, a, she's the, <laughs> let's say, the negative exception. Right. So I, I, think, I think we can be pretty comfortable about that. We have a couple um, from Carrie Leaf. The overwhelming distrust is a second contagion. How do you think we can control potential fighting in the street after the election, no matter the outcome? What preparation should be taking place or do you think scenario planning is already in play? I do. I do. And that would be on the level of the, the, the governors control the National Guard, their National Guard. There's a federal National Guard, but they do. And I have got to believe this pr president who has very little on his mind that doesn't come out that he tells us, they know in advance that he is prepping when they talk about stand back and stand by and all this stuff that I believe, I certainly hope that the preparation is in place right now. Uh, there's just a New York Times breaking news that doctors have begun giving the president steroid treatments because of drops in his oxygen levels. But at the same Ooh. time, they say he may be going home soon. So that's a perfect example of crazy reporting that I don't understand. Uh, my con my, just, I'll just quickly respond to the point about, I have worried, frankly, about civil war for a while. That, that's been a concern of mine because the hardcore, I, particularly on the right, where they, they march with their long guns in states where they're allowed public ex, you know, display of their weapons, this is very I think, serious. But I think all local and state and federal agencies will do the right thing and they're prepared. Um, Lisa Wynn says a Vox commentator said it's possible that Trump could lose the vote and immediately file suit to push the decision to the Supreme Court, thereby <laughs> deciding for Trump. Is that possible? No. 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 Good answer. <laughs> against the rules. I mean, and, and they've talked about, you know, the generals, and he's even said, the generals don't like me. 
But it's like, right, the other troops who like me, and he, the reason he says is they like war. You know, besides calling people who served in the military and died losers and so on. I mean, it's just shocking. But he says the generals like to help the defense contractors. I mean, it's out of the realm of, poss of, of reality any, any longer. Go ahead, can, please. Can Abbott of Texas do what he is doing with poll watchers and dropping number of voting places from 12 to 1? Can this be challenged? It is already being challenged. They already have a, a lawsuit against him. Yeah, the, the, I, I'm shocked at him. I'm shocked at him for doing that. One poll, well, they've reduced X number of counties, and the big county, Houston, has millions of people and have only one box, one drop, one box. One drop box. Right. It's outrageous. I, I just frankly don't understand how any judges who can who claim any kind of fairness and balance can see this kind of action as other than a discriminatory action. I can't understand how you could, but the lawyers on both sides, and, and both sides have large numbers of lawyers, large numbers of experienced lawyers. So in many ways, you could argue it may be also a war between lawyers. And it's interesting, you've had now commentary from Benjamin Gre uh, Greenberg. It's Ben Greenberg. Ginsburg. Ginsburg, thank you. Gin those Jewish names, Greenberg, Ginsburg. Uh, Ginsburg, um, seriously, he was the re Republican election lawyer for 30 years and was very seminal in planning strategy and so on in 2000. He has talked about his shock that these are clearly voter suppression me methods and off the books and absolutely outrageous and un un illegal. Um, as we come towards the end of the hour, I don't see any other questions. I want to remind our people that our Tikkun Olam committee has done work in many different areas, um, getting out the vote, um, protecting the vote, um, engaging our youth. And uh, right. if Rhonda Lindner is on or email me or text me, we'll get you set up um, to send out postcards to do whatever we need to do. Because after today, we know we must, must vote and you should have a, a path that's ready to go. And uh, with, with two minutes left, um, next week, um, first of all, special thanks to Joyce and June. I feel invigorated, I feel hopeful, um, and it's been a long time. I, I, you know, it's been a long four years for, um, for us to kind of have this cloud over us, and I just feel so good this morning. Um, next week, actually, um, we're going to talk about an interesting uh, topic, uh, cancel culture. Oh. And um, Maya Brasher Pashman is going to be with us, and, we're gonna, and she does a podcast for the American Jewish Committee. And it should be really fascinating what we have to say about cancel culture, uh, you know, people who are immediately taken out. Um, and of course, I'm going to have to ask her why, um, you know, the cancel culture did not work um, with um, 45, uh, the current sitting president, yet people around him um, have fell, fell to this uh, new phenomena. Uh, we're getting a lot of thank yous in the, um, in the chat. June and uh, Joyce, take a look there. And um, I think... Um, Diane said we might have a few packs of postcards to send out. They need to be mailed out. So if you're in the vicinity of Macomb Solo Lakeside, you can pick it up. I will check in when I go tomorrow morning to see how many are left. Um, any last words for us? No, we want to be hopeful as well. I love what June is saying. Uh, in other words, just think that one word, landslide, and make it happen. I but obviously, you have to vote in other states. <laughs> Illinois, you know, I mean, it's good I to do that. That's why Joyce is, Joyce is a super patriot. She's voting in Florida. That's right. Yeah. Very intentionally. They need our votes more here than here. They Thank do. You very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Vanessa, for Thank all that you've done. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good, safe time, and we'll see you next week. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much.